Upstairs at Freilich's show 109, real one. proceed right into the trashing of the boxing of Helena, we have to start with The Angel Heart, which was a decent movie. It's a pretty good movie. Uh, I watched it for the first time last week. For the first time? You never saw it before? Never seen it before. Had always heard about it. Of course, the end got spoiled. The end always got spoiled for me by other people out there, you know, being in various horror movie groups, you know, some asshole is going to say, oh, yeah, this is how this 32-year-old movie ended. Right. I, I, don't, you know, now, I don't think we should spoil this this ending because it's a fantastic movie. It is probably one of my favorite movies. It's definitely one of my favorite horror movies and just, just like an like all-around good movie anyway. So I don't, I don't want to spoil it except to say I didn't see, like, I mean, like, I'm not talking about De Niro's character. I'm just talking about the overall story. And the overall story... I was surprised it when I first saw it. Oh, it's a, it's creepy as all hell. It's a it's a it's a very good kind of twist ending that you're not expecting, but I we can reveal to we can at least reveal to people listening that Robert De Niro plays uh, the devil, the Lucifer, because it's in his freaking name. I mean, it's just so freaking L- obvious. Louis Cipher. Louis Cipher. He keeps saying, and Mickey Rourke he keeps, keeps trying. Mister Cipher. He keeps Cifier. trying to put like a like a um, like an accent on it, like a French accent. And, and that's sort of kind of how the lawyer introduces him. He goes, my client, Louis Cephier. And he's like, oh, Mr. And he, but, but he keeps correcting me. He says, it's Mr. Cipher. Mr. Cipher, you know. But I think it's an incredibly, this is like an incredibly fun movie. It's directed by Alan Parker, who is one of the great directors. He directed Fame. He directed Mississippi Burning. Midnight Express, Midnight, buddy. Yeah, Midnight Express from a script by Oliver Stone. Pink Floyd, The Wall. The Wall, and of course, you know, uh, uh, The Road to Wellville. <laughs> uh, also, Evita. This this is Angel Heart, which, is, uh, which was released in 1987 amid a lot of uh, controversy because of, because of the love scene. I mean, um, I honestly don't think the controversy would have been as hard as it was if not for the fact that it was being played by Lisa Bonet. Right, Lisa Bonet. It's beautifully shot and edited. Directed by Alan Parker as a straight-up horror movie with elements of film noir, detective stories of the 40s. The production design is astounding, and the lighting is such that the actors blend into the film and become part of this period piece. The sound design has hints of subliminal effects to it. You have Mickey Rourke, who plays Private Dick Harry Angel, engaged by Robert De Niro's enigmatic Louis Sefia to track down shell-shocked crooner Johnny Favorite. The investigation takes him to New Orleans, where he hooks up with Epiphany Proudfoot, Proudfoot played by Lisa Bonet, daughter of Johnny's secret love, Evangeline. I was telling you when we were talking about this, that Mickey Rourke is perfect for this role. I can't imagine anyone else playing this part. Yeah, nobody. I mean, Mickey Rourke in his prime around that time, nobody else could have pulled that role off. Because he was just, you believe him so much as the sleazebag detective, you know, and nobody yes. else could have done that in 1987. At least I don't think so. Yes, he, Mickey Rourke has a quality to him. He, he definitely does have that kind of what they call the X factor. He's got this sleazy but charismatic and soft voice quality to him. And that kind of makes him rather attractive, I guess. Like he has he has is an attractive quality about him, even though he really doesn't look it. You know. Well, you know, we all know why he isn't attractive anymore, unfortunately. You know. Yeah, I know. One too, one too many punches to the head. You know. Yeah. I, apparently, he had decided. You know what? I don't want to be an actor anymore. I want to be a boxer. So he goes and gets in the ring and starts professionally boxing against other boxers. Gets the crap kicked out of him, and, and you know, and then he gets reconstructive facial surgery, much like 
our uh, our Johnny favorite in this movie. This in Angel Heart, there you have an, a very a very extreme extremely erotic love scene between Mickey Rourke and Lisa Bonet that earned an X rating from the MPAA until Alan Parker, you know, removed ten seconds. And here. I can tell from both cuts that I looked at because the first cut I ever looked at was the R-rated cut, and then I looked at the unrated cut, and yeah, there's there's ten seconds of butt humping going on. Yeah, I would say there's a lot. Like I could, I only ever seen the X-rated cut, but watching as much thrusting that was that was going on in that scene, I'm like, yeah, I can tell this is what should have been removed. Yeah, I guess I okay. guess it should have been, but you know, I mean, there's no penetration or anything like that. It's just a very, it's it's a skillfully, it's artfully directed. And like I said, because the movie is so gorgeously shot, there's like this, there's a lot of nudity rolling around sweat and rain falling from like a crack in the ceiling. You get just so much rain, it gets ridiculous after a while. And then the rain turns into blood and it's spurting blood all over them. And there's a lot of weird shit going on in between all of this. But it's just, it's so, it is one of the most, outside of adult cinema, it's probably one of the most erotic things I've ever seen in a movie. You know, and you got to give it up for Mario Kassar and Andrew Va- Vanya, you know, yeah. for financing this movie. Those are the Corolco guys, right? Yeah, Corolco. You know, no, I don't think any other studio, big studio in that time, yes. would have touched this movie. Yeah, Nobody a- absolutely. Could. Nobody would touch it, at least on that, on the basis of that. It's a great story. It's kind of a downer, but it is a great story. It's got a, it's got a real great mystery vibe to it. In addition to all the, the imagery that's going on in the film, it's just a fantastic film. Now, the only thing, unfortunately. That I said, I told you this. The only thing that takes me out of the film is Robert De Niro because he's he's too big. You know who he is, and he's kind of chewing the scenery, and he's having a lot of fun with the part, obviously, but he he's too distracting for the role. Well, there I I hearken this back to an old Family Guy joke, like when they um there was a joke in the show where they said, oh, you want to know who the killer is on Law and Order? Just look for the special guest star. The special guest star, yeah, that's right. Right, and then like what got me about this movie is they they spell it out for you. Right in the opening credits, they go, special guest appearance by Robert De Niro. What kind of a credit like, is that? That is such a weird credit to have in a that, major movie. That motorcycle. is the dumbest credit. <laughs> special and appearance by? Alan Parker had to meet with De Niro like seven or eight times to explain the part to him. you know. And then after the seventh uh, talk they had and they had lunch or whatever, De Niro finally agreed to do the part. Maybe he was just a little bit weird about playing that part, about playing Satan. Yeah, but then you look what happened three years later. He, he did Max Cady. Yeah, Max Cady, and then maybe maybe he wasn't quite ready to turn to that side because at that point he was still playing you know protagonists or good guys in movies. It's kind of like what he Al was... Pacino. Al Pacino played the devil too later, kind of a variation on that part. Actually. Yeah, but Pacino did. I mean, I'm gonna go off on a limb here. I think Pacino did a much better job. He's laughing his sick fucking ass off. <laughs> That's my outfit. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so just to, to wrap it up, because I know we have the harsher work to do next. Oh, God. Angel Heart is is serious. It's a class. It's a movie that you have to see if you have not seen it. I was frankly shocked that you hadn't seen it. But people need to get out there and see the movie. It's such a beautifully crafted film. So well made. Such a wonderful movie. Did not get the audience it deserved at the time, probably because of the controversy. And, oh, I did mention before, contrary to popular belief, Bill Cosby did actually encourage Lisa Bonet to play this part. And it's not like he actually threw her off the show because she came back on. She came back on the Cosby, and she was on a show that he developed later called A Different World. Remember the first season? And uh, she did come back. So it's not like Cosby was like, well, I mean, the thing about it is I think nobody saw it. Maybe if it was a huge, huge, big monster hit of a movie or something like Mississippi Burning was later for Alan Parker, it might have caused a little bit more controversy. I mean, the movie did make money, though. I mean, it just didn't make wow money. You know it didn't I mean? make it wow made money, money, but it, it so money. should have because it was just so wonderfully made. It, this is the kind of movie I love to watch. Uh, oh, on to the gigantic fucking steaming turd of a movie. This, uh, about, yeah, oh, this wow. this is, <laughs> this. I cannot believe, you know, you know what's really funny about Boxing Helena? If you just... Add, if you put together just a few ju- judicious edits and added a laugh track, this movie could have been a sitcom. It seriously could have been a sitcom. <laughs> Dude, this could have been MST3K'd all to fuck. It could have been riff tracked for all I care. This movie is beyond bad. This, this movie is this movie is fodder 
for fucking Mike Nelson and fucking Joel Robinson. Okay, all we need is Tom. All we need is Tom Servo, Crow, and fucking everybody else. Man, <laughs> this movie is just bad. Ed Wood made better movies than this. Seriously, movie. yes. Seriously, okay, seriously. I honestly don't care for our audience. I'm gonna. St- we are going to spoil the ever-loving fuck out of this movie. Might as well. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to keep secrets on this. I don't really care if it... And a matter of fact, I think this is one of those things, you know, I would I would probably get very fascistic about this and demand that I that that we send soldiers out there and go into people's houses and confiscate every copy of this movie and then burn it in a huge bonfire. This should be burned with people dancing around it and sinking uh, and singing... Uh, um, maybe that song at the end, I Can Make You Love Me. They should all be just just singing and dancing around a fire of video of, 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 of these videos. Every Laserdisc, every video cassette, every... It, is this movie even on Blu-ray? I can't... I mean, it's, on, it's on DVD, but it's out of print. MGM released it sometime back in the early 2000s. I remember seeing a copy at my Half Price Books, and they wanted 25 bucks for it. <laughs> and I was like... Um, and then I had not seen the movie yet. Now this, and oh yeah, like, and it um, came. This this movie came in a very handsome signature edition series, laserdisc, back in the early in in, in the in the mid nineties. I want to say, I remember seeing at the what? at the tower, Why? the Tower Records uh, video annex, and it was in there, and it was in this thing, and it was it was signed, personally signed, and hand numbered by Jennifer Lynch, and it went for like two hundred bucks at the time, and I was oh. I was like, should I get this or get Lord of Illusions? You know, so I grabbed Lord of Illusions instead. Smart fucking move, sir. Oh. But it was such a beautiful looking edition that I was like, there's something special about this. So I was like, you know, maybe I should grab it. But <laughs> this, uh, okay, Boxing Helena came out in September of 1993, I believe. And I gr- dug up some old reviews of it. But the reviews were not really talking about how terrible the movie was. They were talking about how exploitative and sexist the movie was, which is very interesting because it's written and directed by a woman, Jennifer Lynch, who is David Lynch's daughter. It's less a movie and more a whim by Jennifer Lynch. It's like, I want to be a filmmaker like my dad, so I'm going to make this movie. And she went and did it. It's photographed like a lush, erotic Cinemax fantasy with a silky jazz score by Graham Reville, who did music for those kind of movies, kind of silky, jazzy, sexy stuff, rather than the dark, twisted journey into male depravity that I think that she thinks that kind of movie was. I think that Jennifer Lynch thinks Boxing Helena is a brilliant movie, and we're all a bunch of fucking assholes for not liking it. That's what I think. I agree with you. <laughs> I mean, she wants you to like this movie, and I, I and I look at it, there's like, there is not a single redeeming factor of this movie i think you and i talked the only character in this movie that was fucking believable was kurtwood smith (laughs) okay nobody else and for our audience out there all i'm gonna say is this bill paxton in a mesh shirt and leather (laughs) fucking pants yeah he kind (laughs) of like that's why i told you it reminded me of the room because there's this character in the room that is supposed to be a young boy. He's obviously like in his 20s or 30s. What is his name? Johnny or something? Tommy? Yeah. It's the one that, that he's always they're tossing the, the football around and he gets into this drug deal thing. The whole thing, it's, it's like the room is actually kind of, it, it, it does remind me of the room. The room is more entertaining because there's so much more to be to be had. There's so much more fun. But when you're watching Boxing Elena, all you've got is your mouth is hanging wide open. And you're like, what the fuck is this? It's like it's like not a single character in this movie is believable now like the one thing that angers me the most about this movie is Sherilyn Fenn okay who is one of the most beautiful most talented actresses out there she should never in life have to play a filthy cunt like Helena was (laughs) okay and even then we're not even casting so far against type even then we're not even like completely sure if if she is that filthy cunt or if because as we know the revelation of the ending of this movie that she isn't some some character in Julian Sands' dreams or something like that. I mean, we can agree both that she, you know, before the end hit, she is a nasty person in general. Like, she is literally, she is... She it's is so weird. Female, you know, you, you want to say the term womanizer. You know, unfortunately, I can't remember, you know, I don't can't think of the terminology for a woman who is, you know, just goes a whole bunch after a whole bunch of guys. But in the male terminology, it's a womanizer. I think okay? I think that she is just whatever uh, Jennifer Lynch's idea of Julian Sands view of women is. I think that this is is a, a misogynist movie. It's a hatred of women is prevalent throughout this whole movie based on this one character and how Julian Sands looks at her. 
I, I he I, looks at he puts her up on this fucking pedestal. Literally. You know, and yeah, and it's I mean, literally and figuratively, he puts her up on this pedestal. And he's like he's basically saying, This is the best woman I've ever been with. I'm like, I'm like how? I mean, yes, we get it. She's hot, she's attractive. You know, but who why cares does she... she was the best fuck you ever had? Why, why you know well, why? But why the why is she constantly berating him for his sexual performance? There's but there's this not, funny it's bit. It's not just him though. She berates Bill Paxton because okay, that whole scene where Julian Sands was uh, spying in the bedroom window and her and Bill Paxton were going at it. As soon as she gets taken out of the mood, she basically blue balls Bill fucking Paxton. Yeah. Says yeah. no, I don't want to do anything. And she's like, nah, you're done. I don't want to have nothing to do with you anymore. Fuck you. Get, Speaking you know, of fuck which, your couch, why, why, get out of my life. Why the fuck is Bill Paxton even in this movie? This guy did respectable work. Why did he agree to appear in this movie? At the, around that time, he was in like Near Dark. He was in Aliens. He was in the James Cameron movies, of course. And and why the hell is why the hell is he doing this movie? If I can surmise anything, it's because he found out it was David Lynch's kid. And he had some miserable, shitty excuse to do a fucking art house film because you got to figure the types of movies he was doing back in those days. He was he was not doing art house films. He was doing action films, B movies. You know, he could never stretch his acting chops, so to speak. I guess he figures, OK, this is an art house film. David Lynch's kid is going to do it. OK, I'll, I'll join the cast. Why the fuck not? But it's and, so turned out not like an art house film. It turned out like. Like one of these erotic, uh, erotic thrillers from the '90s that we used to see. Remember, like uh, uh, Animal Instinct or 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 uh, twi Twisted Obsession, Twisted Desire, Fatal Obsession, that kind of stuff. This this is trying to. I don't know what it's trying to do. It's trying to make. It's like I said. It the movie feels more important than it actually is. You know, it's like it's it it's Jennifer Lynch's big statement, and she went on to continue directing, but. The movie isn't even known for how bad it is. It's only known for the fact that at one point Kim, Br Kim Basinger was supposed to be in the movie playing Helena uh, opposite Ed Harris, and she backed out. And they sued her, the producer sued her, because that represented an enormous loss in potential profit that they would have had with those two in it. And it, uh, so they wound up getting Sherilyn Fenn and Julian Sands at, a, at bargain basement prices compared to the salary they were going to pay. The other two, they do thank Ed Harris in the credits. Maybe Ed Harris didn't make such a big deal. Maybe he just backed out and just said, sorry, no harm, no foul. If she's not doing it, I can't do it. And, and, and honestly, at the time, Ed Harris was still, you know, a pretty hot commodity around the, the early 90s. He was. So well, yeah, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, he still is. He's a great actor. I love him. I oh, can't. Yeah, I, mean, I, I cannot can't see him. Right. I cannot see him playing this part at all. He's too likable. Julian Sands, maybe. Julian Sands, we've seen in a lot of things. He's been in a lot of, you know. Yeah, but okay. I when I think Julian Sands, okay, um, one of the big movies that I remember him. Okay, Warlock. Warlock, Warlock and yeah. Warlock the Armageddon. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you're talking about this actor who's playing this fucking evil son of a bitch <laughs> yeah. in two movies. You go from that to being the world's biggest crybaby pussy. You did to douchebag too, to boot. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, and it is so not believable. There's this line in there that had me laughing, where where she's talking about his sexual performance and how he's bad in bed or something, and he says, "Why can't you just be like a real woman and lie to me?" And I thought that's a pretty good line. I actually like that line. I would say yes. That I agree. That's like, why can't you be normal and just lie to me? Yeah. Because no no man ever wants to hear the truth. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But that's really, I mean, that's really kind of at the heart of what this whole thing is, is that she's just horrible to him and says horrible things. She has no arms and legs, and I'm laughing my ass off watching this because it reminds me of so many other things that should, that are much better than that. But I mean, when I, when I messaged you that one night, I'm like, please, Lord, do not let this man fuck a stump, okay? Yeah. Because if he does that, I'm out. And then right after I watched the movie, I'm like, you know what? I would have preferred he fucked the stuff. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because this, then, yeah. I, then I would have gotten my money's worth. Let's just conclude this by saying, oh, uh, well, I should probably get into the story a little bit, shouldn't I? Okay, Julian Sands plays a doctor. He's got a thing for Helena. She's beautiful. Sharon Fenn, of course. He likes to watch her have sex through his window, okay, climbing up a tree, looking at her, having sex. Uh, she gets run over by a car. He takes her back to his house rather than to the hospital. He amputates her legs. He keeps her in his home. And then he takes her, her arms away. And, and basically he's having an argument with this stump of Sherilyn Fenn who keeps berating him for his sexual performance. And then uh, Bill Paxton, who plays the jealous kid, 
guy in the mesh shirt comes in. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? You're a fucking freak. You made her a fucking freak. And, and then he's got a gun and there's fighting and struggling and he gets beaten practically to death. And then he wakes up. He was just having a nap. They're, and they bring, they brought Helena in from her car accident. She's fine. Everybody's fine. It was all a fucking dream. It was fuck you, audience. Fuck you. <laughs> You know, that was basically that's it. All that, that's all I got from that was, fuck me. I'm like, wow. You talk about the biggest waste of 90 fucking minutes that you're ever going to watch. I mean, seriously, my, my, my ass I'm like, hurt this piece of shit movie that. pulled a fucking Saint Elsewhere? <laughs> I'm like, really? Why? <laughs> I'm like, you know what? There's nothing redeeming about this movie. You were talking about putting this thing on the Meridian meter, okay? Yes, you my Meridian You know what? Meter. I would rather watch Meridian <laughs> over this piece of shit again. I, I will have to differ with you because, for me, it had two components in its favor over Meridian. Number one, you could see it. And number two, it did have a story. So it gets a two for me on the Meridian meter. Charlene Fenn, you're getting better. Maybe in 20 years you'll be you'll get a number three on there. If I could give this a negative review, I would, like a negative 20, but I'm just going to go with a big fat zero. If you could, I can show you, your, yours would probably be a steaming turd on the Meridian meter. Oh, It would just God. be a steaming turd. A um, steaming pile of dog shit is more like it. But I want to say, to wrap up this video, I've changed the end credits a little bit to reflect the fact that two very, very, very beautiful women were in the two movies that we talked about. So I want to thank you for listening. And um, enjoy this little collage. Good night. Good night. Okay, before we wrap up this episode, my apologies again for boxing Helena. I wanted to show you an example of a successful erotic movie, erotic thriller. This is Body Heat from 1981, written and directed by Lawrence Kasdan, one of the great filmmakers. Can you open it up for me? Let's see what this sucker looks like on the inside. <laughs> oh, and here we have an American uh, label and uh, some kind of a a stamp on it, I guess, uh, from, this was a rental copy because it says something about Be Kind Rewind. We have, of course, the Saul Bass Warner logo. Let's see the back. Here we have, they called it love. The DA called it murder. One of these great Warner Brothers clamshells essays on the back. It's, the, the movie is sexy, but it's not explicit. It's very interesting in that way. There's a lot of, uh, there, it's called Body Heat. There's a lot of sweat. Um, and I remember actually Ted Danson is in this movie in a very small role, Ted Danson from Cheers. So that'll about do it for this, and um, once again, thanks for watching.